my wife and I have had some temperature issues with our Dodge. There's a long history of temperature issues, but most recently and specifically, it's not getting to operating temperature. So we've done some troubleshooting on the forums and we've also read an extensive manual, parts of, and we think we've isolated it to the thermostat stuck open seems to be the, the symptoms we're experiencing. So years ago, when we were first encountering something similar, we purchased a thermostat, and I'm going to replace that now. So this video is going to be mostly about the troubleshooting process, but it's also going to include some of this process too. So this one's reading about 145, about 145 dot in the center, emissivity 0.95, and this one's reading 170, see fish eyes, and we're testing that thermostat here at the same time, so continuing to see It's about 150. About 150. One seventy-five on that one it looks. And it doesn't look as though the thermostat is opened yet. Uh, 
160, 160, and 190. Starting to boil, I expect it should boil at about 190 at this altitude, but I'll have to check tables. So this one seems to be reading just a bit low. Uh, this one's now at 170. And I don't know what this thermostat is rated. Some are 175, some are 190. I think Cummins specifies 190, but this is not a Cummins thermostat. So that one's reading about just shy of 200, over 180, about 182, and 180 in the infrared, and the thermostat has opened. So I'm going to say that that thermostat opens about Let's turn off the heat. So this one is it two probably about two oh four. This one's saying one eighty eight. Showing 180, so we'll say 190, 180, and 204, and that thermostat is full open now. So from averaging three temperatures between this guy, this guy, and the infrared, it's about 189. So it seems appropriate that this thermostat is probably rated at 190. And we'll check the box to see if there's any clear indication. Made in Israel, 4248 plus thermostat. Yeah, I don't see anything. Some people mention that it should be stamped on. It comes with these two rings. Still open as this guy goes down to 180. This guy's down just shy of 200. This is saying one, we'll say 160. So that's about 180, I think. 160.
100 should be 180 equals divided by 3. So why that's now 180 and it's still clearly open here. Maybe it is a 175 thermostat. We've checked the thermo, the um, temperature gauge. We feel confident that that's working because we've turned on the heater and it seems to be at around the same temperature as the. Uh, engine itself. So the temperature needle will come off the wall. And eventually it does get to operating temperature but it needs to be pushed pretty hard up a hill. Uh, we've got a block and radiator, a bit of wool carpet. And still we're finding that it was much too much too slow in getting to to temperature. So we also I also watched a video of a trick. I think the manual recommends removing the alternator and the belt. And I watched a trick some fella in Montana put together a one minute video outstanding where he removes this bolt here on the alternator and then uh, pushes it out of the way leaving access to the three bolts that house the thermostat and the thermostat is under here on the ours is a 98 Cummins diesel 12 valve 5.9 liter so on this one it's on the side here um, yeah, first I'm going to probably snip that out of the way and then just run another 
zip tie underneath. I was hoping to reuse it, but I don't think that's gonna be possible. So you'll probably notice some additional coolant lines. Uh, this is a hose and hose here that goes to a heat exchanger out of the picture and then runs back to a heated tank. If you've watched some of my other videos, you know that we run waste vegetable oil in this truck. And uh, so that's some of the foreign items that would be uh, showing up or an explanation of them anyway. So and that just rotates beautifully out of the way. That gentleman also said in his video that this was a 10 millimeter here. Okay, it seems as though it is for these three bolts. Let me make sure I've got. Sufficient fluid drained off. I think while I'm waiting for that, so I'm further going through the troubleshooting. Obviously, we tried all the cheapest and easiest. Uh, we considered the the fan. Uh, it's a little bit there's a little bit of resistance, and I think the fan is supposed to spin as many as five times freely and this won't spin at all so I began to suspect the bimetallic coil on the front for the viscous clutch that maybe our fan was remaining engaged uh, too fast and for too long so we'll continue to explore that I did read on the Cummins forum where one fella had replaced it. He had a cool running issue. And we're up here in Colorado, 8,300 feet. And and he replaced the I think the entire viscous fan clutch the, on the front, it's a thinned, a thinned piece of hardware on the front of the fan. Uh, he replaced the thermostat. I think he put a block in the radiator, a um, piece of cardboard or something, and he was still having a cool running issue. So we're hoping not to have to jump through all of those hoops to solve our cool running issue. Running waste vegetable oil, we absolutely need the engine to get up to operating temperature. And obviously there's efficiency and fuel economy issues with cool running. And we're talking around 140 degrees because it was the needle was just barely or not coming off the wall at all. Which is abnormal for us. You know, we're used to getting the operating temperature, especially with some block, um, relatively quickly. You know, it may take 15 minutes of driving. If we go down the canyon, obviously it takes a lot longer. It's not until we get into town, 5,000 feet, that uh, it really starts to get warm. 
but still, we're finding that it's not warming up at all. And, along with that, the uh, heater in the truck is cool running. So that, coupled with the fact that the needle does eventually swing, suggests that our gauge is working. So we ruled that out. Uh, we tried to clean, I tried to get in front of the, the uh, viscous fan housing and clean that bimetallic strip with a toothbrush and some degreaser. And then we tried to spray clean it, which didn't seem to work. We tested it out last night, driving to a friend's place for Thanksgiving, and it never got warm even after being plugged in for a couple of hours and about a 20 minute trip. So, that's why we're doing this now. Years ago we had a leak in the radiator, didn't have the money to replace it, so I JB welded it, the local shop wouldn't touch it, so I JB welded it, cleaned up the ends, dimpled it with a punch, and then welded that seam where it was leaking, and that helped for about a year. And it started leaking again, and when funds were more appropriate, we put in a new radiator. But before we put in that new radiator, we also put some stop leak in. So I'm inclined to believe the possibility that we may have some stop leak coming up our thermostat and blocking it in a stuck open position. The manual states that in that case, the... Uh, Onboard computer may trigger a stuck open thermostat code. And when we plugged in our computer to check for codes, it wasn't throwing any of those. So I don't know what it takes for that to occur, but we weren't getting that indication. And then the next troubleshooting step for cool running was to add coolant and we were a bit low on coolant. So we did that two days ago, I think, and still didn't solve our problem. So as I said, a lot of this is about the troubleshooting process as much as it is the uh, replacing the thermostat. I may not have to take this off in order to get to the thermostat, so let me try to keep working here. On this, if I can avoid doing that, then uh, it makes this process one step easier for anyone else repeating the same. That's what I appreciate most and about these videos and why I'm willing to make my own. Most people that do these don't charge for it and they try to make a few bucks on ads. I think one of my best watch videos has earned about four dollars in ads so this is not terribly profitable but I think the benefit to all of us, an example being the gentleman who put the one minute video of this shortcut with the alternator I think the benefit is saving each other time, saving each other money, and maybe a little bit of heartache. And if that's all it does for us, then I think we're doing pretty well. Really well, I'd say.
Um, so my plan is to put in a 180 thermostat. Uh, I think some specifications call for 190. And there's a lot of back and forth on the internet with regards to particularly OEM parts versus AutoZone versus O'Reilly, some of these other aftermarket folks, Napa, you know, arguing back and forth over quality and what have you. I tested the thermostat we got made in Israel. Um, four open close cycles and it seemed pretty consistent to me. Uh, it's what we have on hand and you know, sourcing another one in town is not terribly convenient. So that's what I'm going to use. If you have the option, the consensus seems to be go with the Cummins brand parts to the max extent possible. And that would probably be my position, but I've got a thermostat sitting on my workbench right now and that one is worth more to me than so we've clearly got different size bolts here need to make sure that we put those back in and someone put a bit of red loctite so two long ones on the top short one on the bottom And there's a little bit of red Loctite there, which says to me that someone's probably done this. There's 180, let's say 181 thousand miles on the truck. And I think we're the, the second or third owner. I'm gonna move my flashlight. Previous owners were super hard on it. We continue to find bits there. Right, so that's loose there. Can you talk? Okay. Got that out. I'll just show you, and for me, it's part of why I do these videos is so that I can recreate what I've done. The uh, specifically, we're looking at here. The way those O-rings go in, so. You can see the thermostat backed out there. And then you can see that first O-ring, that big chunky O-ring. So I'm going to try to get this sucker out of here without damaging it in the event that I can repair it and leave it on my bench to use for later. You can already tell that the one that I've purchased is not, not the same. So my coolant looks relatively clear. I'm going to try to reuse that. number of folks will advocate for flushing and what have you. I personally like to try to reuse what I can where I can. Now if we do have to, we bought that thermostat so long ago, I think returning it would be a bit of a fool's errand. But well, obviously something's up. That much is clear. I'll take you over here. So this is encouraging. I told my wife, best case scenario is that we'd find a real obvious 
there's your problem right there kind of situation. I'm trying to find a place for this camera to rest. So if you can see that. Looks like a rubber boot. It's obviously pretty damaged. So I'm gonna pull that out. And uh, I also need to recharge my battery. So <laughs> that's obviously an issue. So this is the answer to our stuck open situation. Here's the thermostat that came out. Obviously this rubber diaphragm is torn up. No, uh, I think chances of using this guy again are, well, it would just be silly to. challenge we face though is that this guy's of a different size. looks to me and very different construction so I think we're gonna try to probably go into town to find something at least closer and ideally a uh, Cummins brand so keep you posted on that And it's possible that we would be able to get this guy the um, aftermarket to work. I'm a little bit suspicious though. So there's the rest of that. It appears to me to be a diaphragm. diaphragm. It doesn't look like the entire made an executive decision to use the thermostat that we have. It's obviously different than the one that came out and my wife went online to search for Cummins um, brand parts and it was seemed to be six of one half a dozen of the other. That is to say that this one appears to be manufactured well of quality construction that was one complaint I heard um, also saw the other factor there is that we also saw relatively wide variation in um, types so we're gonna move forward with what we have particularly with regard to the use of this truck on our remote property. Um, a lot of times we have to make do with what we have. So in the spirit of that, that's what we're gonna do. And then we're gonna test drive it, obviously. Um, we're also having to reconsider the use of specific gaskets and that's especially with regard to what came with the thermostat what was on here before pictures we've seen and then that obviously very funky bit of material that was stuck in the thermostat. We couldn't definitively determine if that material came from the thermostat itself or not. Even from pictures online, it was a bit tricky. So, as I said, we're going to move forward with what we have. This is a second generation Cummins on a number of 12 valve, on a number of various vehicle applications. 
and I think the success of these older engines is largely because they're quite robust and that minor variations in the thermostats or other various parts um, are tolerable to the engine. We're banking on that. You know, part of the gasket consideration was due to this hook here that we've got and um, gasket having to go through that. So the one that we got didn't have a gasket that would do that. And then even in the manual, you know, I think this speaks to some sort of mechanical judgment. Even the manual doesn't have a very clear picture of what the thermostat is supposed to look like. So I think a person could get pretty wrapped around the axle. Getting just the right thing at just the right temperature. You know, these things open. When I did the test on the stove as an example, this one opens anywhere from its opening and closing process. I need to focus here for just a minute. It's opening and closing process is from about 175 to 190 degrees. So it'll be partially open in that range anyway. So folks that are getting really nitpicky with actual temperature settings, you know, and whether or not the indicator in the truck is reading correctly. Uh, a bit of my personal background, I used to work as a test engineer and technician on a next generation technology wind turbine. And we did a lot with temperature. And we had, the company basically had 14, 40 million dollars of capital to fund this effort, research and development. And I was primarily focusing my attention on temperature behavior of certain components in the system. So that is to say we had available to us the best of temperature sensors, etc. We used resistive thermal devices, we used infrared, lasers, some pretty advanced stuff and we had temperature sensors all over this sucker so the point I'm trying to make is that even in that scenario temperature was a terribly elusive figure to really nail down and you'll see that this video when I put it together when I was doing the stovetop test I had three sensors going two drop-in thermometers, and then one infrared, right? So what's the point of that? Well, a guy with two watches never knows what time it is, is basically the point. And temperature is totally relative to where you take it. You know, hopefully they've placed the temperature sensor, and I frankly don't know. I'm not terribly interested in finding out exactly where at this point, but at some point I probably will where that one temperature sensor is on this truck that communicates to the to the driver what the temperature is will have an impact on the temperature that it reads the type of system that's used so if you put 40 million dollars into your R&D on this truck and I don't even think Dodge does that then you could probably Nat's ass down to a tenth of a degree what the temperature of your truck was running but more than likely you're going to be dealing with variations as much as I would guess five to ten degrees I'd certainly love to hear a Cummins 
a seasoned Cummins mechanic and or engineer get on and say or make a comment or send me an email and say you know you got it all wrong or you're dead on you know these trucks vary and even from engine to engine they're not all made exactly the same as much as we'd like to believe in an industrial process they are so one running at 195 might be optimum another running at 203 but then variations in where that temperature is sensed you know I think we can get really wrapped up around it and I know that guys and gals want to do the best by their trucks because they provide such a valuable they are such a valuable resource and at the same time speaking from the perspective of an engineer I was trained as an aeronautical engineer those numbers are nice to get close to get in the ballpark but if your truck is running well you know from my perspective I don't really care if it's at 207 or 193 if it's running efficiently and then taking that between engines or comparing with some guy who's in Canada versus some guy who's in Florida hopefully you're starting to get my point environmental differences and all of that and I see guys on get on the forums and they're trying to compare what it's supposed to be and they get really concerned about you know the exact open on their thermostat I frankly don't think it matters that much as robust as these vehicles are and again from the perspective of an engineer it just doesn't make sense to me that they would be that finely tuned and be as reliable as they are because you start finely tuning something to too fine a degree and you narrow its operation you narrow where it's going to be effective and we see this with aircraft a lot and especially joint strike fighter or something like that and I've worked with engineers that have designed the engine on a joint strike fighter and I myself flew warthogs if you've seen some of my other videos that much is obvious A10s and what was great about the A10 was it was a lot like this truck it was clunky it was big but it was super robust so if my exhaust gas temperature varied by a few degrees and I'm thinking that maybe it was even variations of 10 to 100 degrees but that was a long time ago so I can't remember exactly and everything sounded good and I had sufficient thrust to make it down the runway I was a happy chappy and I could argue with my mechanic all day about you know just exactly where that needle was and he'd probably just roll his eyes at me you know saying Lieutenant, I don't think it matters that much. So it didn't. I don't think this sucker's going in. So me. I'm just give it a little tap. The other thing, I didn't look up the torch specification, but something that I'm aware of anytime I'm using a over o ring is to be mindful not to tighten it too much. Some people get real western, as I say to my wife. Get real Texas because y'all in Texas don't do things halfway 
on the fasteners, certain points that's appropriate. If you're talking about some systems or some fasteners, they've got to be pretty snug. But a bolt functions like a spring. And if you think about compressing, and this is from my days on working on wind turbines up tower too, not just the R&D side. But um, if you think of a bolt as a spring, and you compress that spring all the way, or you stretch it to the point of yield, it's no longer doing for you what you need it to. So a bolt is similar in that. If you stretch it too far, you'll either strip it or break it. They've definitely broken some big bolts. So getting the torque right on those is, is important in those scenarios. When an O-ring is involved, if you crush that O-ring, it'll start to crack. The pressure will start to crack the rubber. So it's not necessarily better if you've got a leak somewhere to tighten it. You generate those cracks and now you make a leak worse. Best thing when an O-ring is involved is to get the torque as close as possible. And a lot of it comes down to feel. I've met a number of mechanics that have better feel for a machine than the engineers do, and the engineers will rely on a number, and there's high potential there to break something. So it really comes down to, you know, an individual's hands. In fact, I'm going to go through these, um, or at least this one. I can't reach those others unless I get out my open with a bare hand. So I don't crush my O-rings. And hopefully you don't have any leaks, but you know, the worst case scenario, really here. That feels pretty good. You know, and a general rule of thumb, the size of the wrench, the size of the fastener will dictate the appropriate load on it. So a bigger fastener obviously will need. Oh, that's loose. So I'm pretty satisfied with that. And you'll see, you know, some people may be horrified by this. I'll just show you what I do here. We've got a couple minutes. Um, you may be horrified by all of these clips that I leave the ends on. And they're all over my heat exchanger there. I do that for a reason. And as I alluded to earlier, our remote property is 25 miles away. I can certainly use string if some of these broke. But the reason I leave these ends is so that I can reuse them if I need to. I get the blade of my pocket knife inside of that tooth. It's going to be real tough to see. And I lift it up. Slide the end out and I can reuse this tie anywhere I want. So, signing off for now. Got to go make a phone call. Alright, update on temperature troubleshooting. 
just got the truck up to temp. And it seems to be running great. Expecting now for leaps. I don't see any. I wanted to take a moment to shoot it with the IR camera and the IR sensor. Show you guys. So there's 320 at the exhaust manifold. There's 156 on the valve cover. Coolant line at 135. So that's 100 there on the, I think that's where the intake heaters are. So the point I was making, let's shoot the turbo too, because I was climbing a pretty steep hill and really boosting it. 117F on the turbo. What else could I look at? That's probably the major stuff. Let's see what the airflow going in is. That's at about 100. And I'll show you too, this is our uh, American made industrial grade preheater. It's just some ratty old wool carpet with a jute backing that we put in the front here. And um, today, outside, we'll shoot the door or something. No, it's not doing it. Maybe the ground. Outside, it's about 55 degrees. Um, nice, heavy winds out here. But the uh, temperature is sitting nice and happy. So 165, I think, is the mark between 140 and 190. And I'm going to say that's halfway again, 165, and we'll read it straight on. So, what, probably 15 degrees, 175, 180, probably right around 175, 180, which is what the thermostat tested out. I'm going to turn on the heater, because that was another consideration for us. Much better performance on the heater. So I feel reasonably confident in uh, saying that our major issue was the thermostat. That rubber stuck in there, stuck open. But I'm also, I've also got my eye on that uh, viscous fan clutch as well because it seems a little sticky. And I just finished climbing probably better than about a 12% grade steep dirt road up to about 9.5 uh, second gear about a little over 2,000 revs most of the way and it's about a six mile climb on a dirt road four-wheel drive and never once got above 190 even with 55 degrees outside and the uh, wool beanie or wool beanie in the uh, front of the radiator there so really satisfied with this fix I'm satisfied too with the thermostat even though it's not a Cummins part I'll keep an eye on it it looked like it was well made and uh, even to some extent a little bit better than the one I took out so that's not a big concern to me but thanks for watching again to recap we were troubleshooting a cold running truck the temperature wasn't even coming off the wall previously after you know as much as half an hour driving so a lot of this video is about the troubleshooting process was it the fan I didn't show you guys any of that when I dug into I had a, a reflective mirror looking at the bimetallic strip and it looked like there's some gunk on there uh, troubleshooting the fan and continuing to do the cheap and easy stuff, adding coolant, 
first until it became absolutely obvious that we needed to crack open the uh, crack open the thermostat. Couple more temperatures here. That's not the radiator. I think that's the oil cooler, maybe. Those of you watching will probably be all the better state. There's the radiator. About 80 degrees. Again, that radiator pipe. About 127. Back in there at the intake. 91. Valve cover on the front. 130. Exhaust manifold's now down to 245. And then I'll get the muffler back here too, so we've got, you know, all the way through the exhaust system. Down to 91. 240 to 91. So, and that climb that I just did was on vegetable oil as well, so now our, we're able to switch over better. But in troubleshooting this process, everything seems to have worked out well. Leave your courteous comments and suggestions in the in the comments. I love hearing what you guys have to say, and I love helping you troubleshoot your stuff too. If you're having issues, uh, hit me up online via um, Gmail or otherwise on YouTube, and I'd be happy to help you troubleshoot some of your issues. If it gets real involved, then of course I'm gonna have to charge you for it. Uh, but I think a lot of us gain a lot from sharing information with each other and I'm happy to do that. I certainly save time with a YouTube video doing this process here today. So thanks for watching.